Matthew 2. This is the Magi. This is a year after his birth. A year after his birth. <clears throat> it says, now after Jesus was born. Huh? This is a year later. Now after Jesus was born at Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star. Remember, they're magi. Uh, their religion was astrology. We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard it, he was troubled at all Jerusalem with him. And gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he began to inquire of them where Christ was to be born. And it, interesting, they came looking for the king of the Jews and he knew it through his people, what he, they were talking about. They were talking about Christ, the Messiah. And uh, they said to him in Bethlehem of Judea, so it has been written by the prophet. Then he goes to Micah 5, 2, you Bethlehem, land of Judah, by no means least among the leaders of Judah. Talks about a small city in Judah. Out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. He wasn't born in the major city. He wasn't born in Jerusalem. Yes, where you would expect a king to be born, but he wasn't. In fact, it was prophetic. It was prophesied uh, 800 years beforehand that he would be born in the least of the villages of Judah, the least of the cities of Judah. And not only would he be a ruler, but he would be a shepherd ruler. Notice that. Then Herod secretly called the Magi and, and ascertained from them the time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem. He said, go make careful search of the child. And when you have found him, return and report to me that I may too come and worship him. And having heard the king, they went their way and lo, the star, which they'd seen in the east, went on before them. Now he's in the west. The star has, okay. Uh, went on before them until it came and stood over where the Christ child was. Now he was born in a what? Amen. But they visited a house. Okay. Uh, they fell down and they came they, the, with the mother. They fell down and worshiped him and opened their treasures. They presented to him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed uh, for their own country another way. Because if you read on, which we will do next time we meet, uh, Herod is going to kill all the children in Bethlehem vicinity. That's two and under, all the males, all the boys. Okay, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into our study. We're going to talk about the religion of the Magi that brought them. I mean, was it the religion that brought them? Was it the star that brought them? Well, they were, this was their religion. They were watching a star out of their religion. But we'll learn that it wasn't the star that brought them. And it wasn't the religion that brought them. It was God. God. Same one that brought you here tonight. Same one that brought you here. It was God that brought you. I don't know how you got here, but God brought you. Okay, so let's have a word of prayer. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest. That is, if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. When you believe that, you become a believer. You become a believer in Christ. The gospel is the power of God to save you the moment you believe. And you, because you live in the church age of the new covenant, the Holy Spirit takes up residence inside your body. And your body in God's presence becomes the temple of God because the Holy Spirit dwells there. Now, the Holy Spirit is there to guide you, teach you, instruct you, empower you to do the things of God. He cannot teach you the Bible. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You cannot understand it unless the Holy Spirit teaches it to you. It's not a typical book. What would prevent the Holy Spirit teaching you is personal sin. 
It could be mental attitude sin. It could be sin of the tongue. It could be overt sin. But that has to be confessed in silence before you study to get any spiritual understanding of the Bible. And that's why the one reason the Holy Spirit is in your life. And he is in your life forever. John 14, 16. He is there forever. So I'm going to give you a moment in your priesthood. Every believer is a priest in this dispensation. Of 1 Peter 2. I give you this moment to confess sin. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister truth to your life. This is the truth that will set you free from all the struggles you're going through in your life. Understanding the ministry and the truth of the word of God. The ministry of the, of the Holy Spirit and the word of God is the secret to your life. I mean, you probably think it's something else, but it isn't. It, that, that's it. Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way, both by automobile and by internet. Uh, we pray tonight, Father, the Holy Spirit would minister to us. It is an amazing thing that these people were involved in a pagan religion. How is it that they had this prophetic word from God in this religion? How did that get in this religion that was anti-God? It was polytheistic. It was built off of a world belief system. Divination and, 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 and all of those other satanic tools. How is it possible that these people, how is it possible that they got it and uh, the people of Israel had no clue? How is that possible? Well, the Bible says a star appeared to him. Yeah, but what's that mean? And why would they, why'd they come looking for Christ? Well, we'll discover that today. And it, it, and it will help us understand how God works with us. How we are where we are for whatever reason. So we've made this prayer in Jesus name. Amen. Last week, we learned that the prophecy of the king star they referred to this star out of the religion of astrology. They referred to this star as the king star. They come looking for the king of the Jews. And so it, it became titled the king star. What's interesting, this star didn't come from the religion of the Magi, but rather from the prophet, prophets of Israel. Let me, let me show you what I mean. How did they get this? How did they put the pieces together? There are three prophecies that are important to these people. And a missionary had to get that word there. So who were the missionaries that, that gave them the word that that star meant that it would be a king of the Jew and he would be the savior of the world. He would be the king of kings and lords of lords. Okay. So here we have, mm, here it is on your paper. I gave you three and these are really important. For example, in Genesis 49, 10, we are told it's the sepulcher of Judah. Look for the sepulcher to come from Judah. That's a prophetic word out of Genesis. Now we're back. We're, we're, you know, we're, we're the first book in the Bible, aren't we? Then in numbers, so a, a sepulcher, uh, in other words, a, a ruler, a special ruler would come from Judah. Then we're told in Numbers, the 24th chapter, verse 17, that there would be a, a special star, a star of Jacob. We learn that from a guy called Balaam in Numbers 24, who was part of this religious organization. And, and he gave four oracles. And the fourth oracle was really important. The fourth oracle is where he, where the, he talks about the star of Jacob. The third one is Daniel, and he was the great missionary. Daniel, in the first chapter, talks about... Now, I want, to show, I want you to understand something about how, how Daniel... D Daniel was the missionary to this group of people. But how did he get there? Well, in 586 B.C., Israel fell to Babylon under the fifth cycle of divine discipline. And they carried all the young intellects out of Israel to Babylon. 
and they ran them through a school. And those who were really bright, they put them in their educational system to become part of their um, intellectual operations. They were world power. And so they would take all, depending on how they, uh, how they did, they, were, they would be given assignments in engineering or whatever and sent all over the world. In the very first chapter of Daniel, we're told that there were four guys that stood out in, in, the, in the school. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. These four guys just were lights out. And they tell us that. I mean, it's very clear in Daniel 1. These guys were, these guys, now look, they're Israelites. They've gone to a foreign nation, a foreign language. These guys were so sharp. Now, how did they become that sharp? The Bible tells us because of God. God, you know, intellect is human IQ is a wonderful thing when you're dealing with the world. Spiritual IQ tops that every time. Spiritual IQ is the stuff you've learned from God. The stuff you learned. What made them intellects, geniuses, was that they had good human IQ, but they had divine IQ. And that divine IQ put them above the class. It will do it every time. It will do it every time. It will do it in whatever school system you're in or whatever college you're in. What trumps your intellect is the genius of God that you've bought into because God's a genius. Right? I mean, he's a genius. And so when you add what you have in intellect in your training, you add the divine viewpoint to it, it puts you lights out. It, it, and he, and these guys are described and they, they, listen, they haven't been in town that long, four or five years. They've gone through their educational system and they've just knocked it out of the ballpark. It gets back to the King that these, there are four Israelites that are just, I mean, they're just, it would, you could give them, you could, you could put them into any field you want. They're, be, they're that good. You could put them in engineering, medicine. You could put them in any field. They could do it. They're described as, listen to me now, 10 times wiser than the wisest men of Babylon. Babylon was known for their intellect. They were, they were, they were lights out in engineering and medicine and everything. And Daniel became... He worked his way through God. It, the, the, I mean, God presented things to the king that nobody could answer. Nobody could answer them. They would all get together and they would go like, go back to the king. And go, oh, I can't do it. He said, somebody would say, well, you ought to ask Daniel. So he called Daniel in and Daniel would go, yes, but I got to tell you something. The only way that I can give this to you, it comes from God Almighty. Now, see, the, the, the Babylonians were a polytheistic. They believed in a lot of gods. They, I mean, they were interested in all of them. That was the good part of this, kind of like, like in Acts 17 when, at, at Athens, where the, you know, we had all the idols to all the gods. And Daniel would go in, and the king would say, you know, nobody can answer this. What do you think? And he said, well, let me start by telling you that my answers come from Jehovah God. Make that very clear to you. I don't get this anywhere else. I get it from him. Well, the king would give him it, and, and God would give him the answer. The God would give him the answer. And so in Daniel, the second chapter, time we get to Daniel, and Daniel is a wonderful book to read. Now, there's a lot of prophecy in it, but it's just a wonderful, it's just a fun book to read. Don't try to get, don't try to become 10 times wiser. <laughs> just read the book and enjoy it. It's, it's a phenomenal novel about a y young guys. And here's my point. They, could, they, they couldn't have been under worse circumstances. A nation invaded them. I mean, really sacked them. They were brutal in warfare. The Babylonians were brutal. And they really, they really put a number on. And so, they, I mean, they had kin people die in that war. And they were drug off as POWs. They didn't get good treatment until they got there and went through school. And that's a pretty tough situation. 
right? And listen, they bounce back. You know how they bounce back so quick? I mean, their parents probably got murdered, their brothers, their sisters, their, their uncles, their aunts, a lot of people. I mean, their school teachers, all of that. I mean, it's pretty tough to overcome, wouldn't you think? This is why this is a great novel. It's a great book. How did they, how they, how they bounce back on their feet? Well, you say they were youth. Listen, they could have went the other way. I've seen young people just have bad things happen in their life and they just fall apart. Been in, I've been in this a long time. How'd they bounce back on their feet? Well, they tell you, God stuck them in a furnace. You know how they got out? God. I mean, they were Christ-oriented people. They got caught up in a nation that had stood in opposition to God when they should have stood for him, they stood against him. And there were casualties in that, right? In that apostasy. But listen, they didn't lose their stride. They didn't lose their walk with God. So here's Romans 8, 28. Here's how you use Romans 8, 28, just like they did. Here's how they used it, Right? All things work together for good. Now, you've got to buy into that philosophy for bad things come, right? Because people always talk about, I'm having a bad day, bad things come to your life. And you describe a lot of incidents in your life as bad things. I remember in my junior year, we moved from a community I had gone through school with all my buddies, and we were on a football team together. In my junior year, my folks moved to the city. To a whole nother school system. And I thought that was a bad thing. It devastated me for a while. You know? But here's the point. How do you bounce back? Because God says that's not true. There are no such thing as bad days. There are no such thing as bad things, right? How do I know it? Romans 8, 28 says something. All things Work together for what? Didn't say some things. Didn't say some things, did it? Did it say some things? It says all things. So you got to buy into that mindset because things are going to happen in your life that you're going to call bad. My car broke down. I don't have transportation. My power went off. I don't have electricity. My gas went. I don't have this. I don't have food. I don't have you, you'll call that bad. Does God call that bad? Does God call that bad? There's no bad days. God don't have bad days. If he don't have no bad days, you don't have no bad days. It's a philosophy you buy into. He says all things work together for good to those who love God to those who are called according to his divine purpose. That word purpose is really important because in the Greek language, that word purpose is P-R-O-T-H-E-S-I-S. -S, and it means this is before something that's been placed in your life that's already been established so that when it comes down, it means something's been predetermined. Something's been predetermined. So, something's been predetermined. You go like, well, how back, how far back did God have this predetermined that's, that I'm going through right now? My life right now sucks. You ever heard people say, my life sucks? Yes. I hear it all the time. I'm a pastor. I hear it all the time. I go like, how's that possible? Do you believe in God? Yes, sir. Then how was that possible? Because we're told that all things work together for those who love God, for those who have been called into his predetermined plan. How far back did God have my life figured out? At the eternal life conference. Before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1, 3, and 4, before the foundation of the world, he had your life mapped out, and it's running according to the predetermined will of God. That's why you embrace everything that comes down your life because it is good for you. God has predetermined it. Switch your life, your mind life into that fact it's good and embrace it because only good is going to come from it. 
And if you doubt that, study Daniel. He was a teenager, man. And your life could never suck as bad as it did. On your worst day, that would be a good one he would trade any day for. <laughs> you understand that? All things, all things work together for good because God has predetermined your life in Christ. If you're in Christ, your life has been predetermined to be what? Good. G-O-O-D. You know why that extra O is in there? It's O God. That's the name of the game. Romans 8. And so this is what Daniel is going through, right? And so God sent him to be a missionary. And Daniel goes in there. He's all full of Christ, right? He goes into the fiery furnace. He said, he said, I see three. No, there's four men in the furnace. And he said, I'm doing fine. Christ is with me. Right? How are you guys doing? You cooking medium rare? How? You know, the guys that stuck him in all got burnt sticking them in. How are you doing in there? We're doing good. Having a picnic. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. You understand? How you boys doing in there? <laughs> We're doing good. How come we don't do that? How come we don't do that? How come we don't do that? That's why he drug you in here tonight. That's why he did it. Daniel answered before the king and said, As for the mysteries about which the king has inquired, neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, or div diviners are able to declare to the king. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and I'm your man. I'm the man of the hour. Now, he didn't have toot his horn. The king is going to toot it for him. You do know that, don't you? We learn that it was God who sent these magi to Jerusalem. It was God who sent them to Bethlehem. It was God who sent them to the Christ child. And it was God who sent them home safe. Because he was going to kill them. Now, who do you want on your team? Right? You know how you put, choose up sides? You know the first time I choose? God. I did God. Come on over here. I, the second, second one, I want Jesus. Come over here. Third, I want the Holy Spirit. Then I'll start picking you. That's the three guys I want on my team. How come we don't do that? How come we don't do that? Matthew 2.12 says, the last verse says, and having been warned by God in a dream not to return to, Her to, return to Her Herod, the Magi left for their own country another way. He'd kill them if they went back the same way. Killed all the kids, didn't he? Killed all the kids. All the boys. All the boys. Let me tell you a few things tonight before we go. You know when this, remember this right here? The, the plan of God, the purpose, it comes out in our life. The plan of God comes out as purpose in our life. That's why the word purpose, that's the plan of God. It comes out in purpose. You know why you ought to be studying the will of God? You study the word to get the will to, to understand what work God wants you to do. That's how it works. Right there. Right there in Genesis 1, 14 through 19. Look it up. You got your Bible? Come church with the Bible. Come church with the Bible. Come church with the Bible. Here's Genesis. We're in the fourth day. Here's Genesis, first chapter. First chapter of Genesis. I'm in the fourth day of creation. This start comes from a fourth day of creation. When did God? God predetermined everything that... Everything that flows out in this, God predetermines. God pre And here's a star that shows up that's got Christ's name written on it. The star of Christ. And right here's where it comes from. It comes from the fourth day. 
I want you to pay attention to it because this is going to be this right here. There's going to be a star that has Christ's name on it. Are you with me? Has his name on it. And those who understand signs will know the meaning of it. Now pay attention. Here I am. I'm in the first chapter. This is where, this is where the star is going to come from. It comes from the fourth day. I'm in verse 14. Now watch. This thing is broke down into three parts. This day, fourth day, now pay attention, is broke down into three parts. You're going to see in verse 14, God said. In verse 16, God made. In verse 17, God placed. He didn't do this in all the days like this. This is a unique day. God did three things on this day. God said, God made, and God placed. Do you see that? Okay. All right, now watch it. These three sections. Here, here's the first section God said. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. Now watch this. Because I'm into lettuce. Right? I'm into lettuce. Let, let, let there be, and here's another let. Let them be, see, let, the, let there be lights. Let them be for signs, for seasons, for days, and for years. Now, we don't have any of those in heaven. Those are all earthly, right? I mean, God's eternal, people. They don't run, God don't carry a watch. All right. Let them, here's my third let, right? Here's the third let. Let them be for lights in the expanse of the heaven to give light on the earth, and so it was. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, the lesser to govern the night, and he made stars also. God placed them in expanse of heaven to give light to the earth and to govern the day and the night and to separate light from darkness, and God saw that it was good, and there was evening and there was morning, fourth day. Now, where did that star come from? And, and where did the idea that you could have a sign connected to it and that you could have days Day, the calendar would run off from this system, right? See, you're already smarter than most people. Most people don't know that. Geniuses don't know that. People who have spent their life exploring this, and they have doctorate degrees, don't understand that. Because of the genius of God, you understand it tonight. That's what made Daniel... Ten times wiser than all the wisest men in Babylon. So the this king star that they're seeing is going to have a sign associated with it. And it's and it's been decreed at the Eternal Life Conference in eternity past, is now playing out under the purpose, is now playing out in the plan of God in human history. Therefore, in Ephesians 1, 3, and 4 on your paper. It means that this was decreed, this star, this special star for his son was decreed in the plan of God at the eternal life conference before the creation of the world. Here's what it says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him, watch this, before the foundation of the world. When we read Genesis 1, 14 through 19, we discover the three parts. God said, God made, and God placed. The part that we're interested in our story today that Daniel was able to explain to these brilliant people who studied the stars for religious reasons, they used stars to somehow connect with the gods, and they, but they didn't understand how all that worked. Daniel comes along and says, oh, man, I got this. Genesis 1, here's how this works. And what you're seeing is Christ because of Genesis, the third chapter, verse 15, and uh, away, the, away they went. Took a missionary. Daniel was that missionary. 
The second thing you need to understand is a divine sign. Divine signs can be interpreted by two ways. A divine sign can be interpreted by two. You can do it by sight, human, or you can do it by faith, divine. You can go the world system or you can go the God system. You're going to go one way or the other because there's not a third. You're either going to go God's way or the devil's way in the way you perceive things. The things that you perceive, the things that you believe will come from one of these two sources. There is not a third. There's not a third. And they're diabolically opposed. Sight is perception. What's connected with sight is eyes and ears. Eyes and ears. We talked about this last time. Uh, eyes and ears. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor entered into the heart of men the things that God has prepared them from eternity. 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. If you could just grasp that for a moment, it would, it would, it would change your life where you are and would put you on a journey on this earth that would be the most fantastic journey you ever walked in your life. The most fantastic journey you ever walked. Sight is a perception either by the eye or the ear. And I wrote that down. It's a quote from Isaiah 64.4 if you're interested. It is interesting that two people can see or hear the same thing and draw different conclusions. Now we all know that. When it comes to the spiritual realm, you, sight is cosmos, it's worldly thinking, cosmos diabolical by meaning the devil runs that system. And the other view is faith, which comes from the divine system. Where does faith come from? Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing, hearing the word of God. So when you have Matthew 2, 11, you have the Magi. The Magi have a religion that comes from the world. It's a religion. It's astrology made into a religion. But they've got divine viewpoint. Where did they get this divine viewpoint? You see, they got it from Daniel who taught them, open the scriptures up like I'm doing to you tonight, open the scriptures up and cause them to become alive. Right? I mean, the, the Bible's a dead book until the Holy Spirit gets it and starts bringing cha-chings into your life. You know, a cha-ching? Moment. Here's Herod. Herod lives in Israel. Herod has got these wonderful uh, people around him. He can ask them a biblical question. Boom, they can get the answer. And he's operating by Cosmos Diabolicus. You got magi who come out of that system, who have gotten divine light, and they're there hunting for Christ. He belongs to this divine system, and he's dumber than a brick. He's not got a clue. He goes to church every, every Sunday, just as faithful, and he's as dumb as a brick. Because he's getting his information out of, for his life, his purpose in his life is coming from a system that God doesn't operate in. But the devil does. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. That's why you would be smart to get to Bible study every chance you get. You know why? Because it makes you it makes you 1% wiser than you were the day you, you didn't come. And if you spend, put your head in it long enough, you'll become smarter than anybody in your school. Though they go to church, they don't learn nothing because they had, don't have an interest in learning it. It goes one ear and out the other because they don't stop it. <laughs> right? You have the ability to stop it. If you stop it, though, you'd have to stop and think about it, which would be a good thing. Faith is cycling the word of God into your heart. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard the things that God has prepared for the heart. 
See, God wants you to think with your heart, not just your mind. Your heart is that, is that superpower of intelligence that you can have to make you 10 times smarter than anybody else in the world. You'll never be 10 times smarter than God, but you'll be smarter than 10 times people that don't pay any attention to the word of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 7, we speak God's wisdom in a ministry, in a mystery, a hidden wisdom, a hidden wisdom that, which God predestined before the ages to our glory. Predetermined. For it is God who revealed these things to us through his Holy Spirit. For the Holy Spirit searches all things, watch this, even the depths of God. I mean, how much do you honestly know about God? I mean, how much do you really know? Oh, you go like, oh, I know the essence box. I can tell you. Oh, yeah. Well, then, okay. Then give me how omnipotent power worked in your life this week. Oh, I understand omniscience. I understand them. They're, okay, show me how the all intelligence of God worked in your life this week. Because, see, I'm not talking about knowing all this stuff on a piece of paper that has no reality in your life. God is real. He's a living, powerful being. And he's there to be dynamic in your life. When you say that God is omnipresent, do you really believe that? Why do you lie in secret? God can't hear you? What, what kind of a secret do you have that God don't know? And if you do know that he knows all things, that he is all, all wise, then why aren't you paying attention to him? He is what makes you wise. He is, he has omniscience. He's willing to share it with you. You are able through the word of God to study God, bring God into the reality of your life. And now you get to study the depths of who God is. I mean, how much do you really know about God? I'll tell you what you need to know is that in practicality, what he wants to do is he wants to bring this identity of God into purpose of your life, right? That's the word purpose. That's what happens when you go to college and you don't become 10 times wiser. Here's the third thing. Satan. I'll tell you who goes to Bible study. Satan. Huh? Huh? He went to the first Bible study, which the Lord did in the Garden of Eden, in the cool of the day. I don't know what a hot day was, but I would, it was cool. Is Bible study cool to you? Is it cool? Huh? That's a, you, you thought that, that is a term that just the hop guys had, you know, the in-group. Listen, cool came out of the Bible. It was Bible study. It was a word that was attached to Bible study. Cool. Where'd you go yesterday? Went to Bible study. It was cool, man. It was cool. That's that word. Well, you'll learn something every new. I'm trying. My goal is to make you 10 times wiser. Now, here's what he did. Look what the devil, he went to Bible study. He got this Genesis 1, 14 through 19. He went, whoa. He got that signs. <laughs> Here's what I'm going to do. And so what he did is he took creation. He took the fourth day, which deals with the heavens, right? The stars, the moon, right? He listened to God name all the stars. That's like naming this grant. This, you know, you go to the ocean, you know, you go to Florida, you go to the beach, you get a handful of dirt or a, ba a bucket of dirt, sand, you know, sand. And so you, 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 so they give you the, they give you this job. Mother says, look, I'll, I'll give you a dollar for every piece of sand, but you got to go all through the bucket. You got to count every one of them and name them. And I'll give you a dollar for each one. If you can get it done before we leave, leave the 
our vacation. How long are we here, Ma? Two days. What are the odds? Huh? You commit suicide before you can get halfway down through that thing. That's what I'm talking about. When he talks about the stars of heaven, he talks about the grains of sand. Puts them in the same breath of discussion. Named every star. I mean, about the third one, I'd have been called star one, star two. <laughs> After I ran out of Billy Joe and Bubba, my vocabulary would be done. Can you imagine that? So he takes this idea, he takes this idea, and he develops a religion out of it, of astronomy, astrology. He develops a whole religion out of it. And listen, and then he sends missionaries with it. It's spread across the entire world. When, when Joseph went into Egypt, that's what Egypt was into. When Moses, uh, when Moses went into Egypt, that's what they were into. When he came out of Egypt, went into the land of Canaan, that's what they were in. When Daniel went to Babylonia, that's what they were in. That's what everybody's in that's not in Christ. They're into some kind of religious gobbledygook. <laughs> because the devil runs that system in opposition to God. So in 2 Corinthians 2.11, Paul understanding that, Paul said, listen, you need to study the Bible so that you're not ignorant of the scheming of the devil because that's the other belief system that's working in your life. Do you have any clue how the devil works in your life? I don't, I'm not talking about how your flesh works. <laughs> We can figure that out just by being with you a while. But let me tell you, the scheming of the devil is a whole different ball game. You're talking about how, you're talking about military intelligence on a level that you're not capable of. You know that from Ephesians the sixth chapter, put on the full armor of God, right? I hope so. Ephesians six eleven. And when he talks about Adam and Eve, he said, "You know what got him?" Deceit. Deceit. How could they be deceived? They were, they were perfect. Devil got him. How could he get him? They stopped believing the truth. You know how he gets you? There are only two systems. Your, your beliefs are coming either from God and the word or they're coming out of the world. Ain't no third. Two bases. That's not hard, is it? You don't have to run four. Home run is if you can just get to one base and back. That's not bad. Is that? I think I could run that done. Don't have to steal. Don't have to do anything. Satan took the truth of the fourth day of creation, developed it into an ancient religion that's still around. Then he spread it throughout the world. Do you know that in 2 Thessalonians 2, 8, 9, the Antichrist is going to work that system? In Acts, the second chapter, 19 through 21, uh, the, the writer talks about at the second advent, that whole, that whole world system is going to come into play again with signs. The, the, sun, the, the, uh, the sun is going to turn into darkness and the moon into blood. That'd be interesting. The stars will start falling. And it won't be from a rock concert. They'll be falling. If you want to see how the Pharisees use it, you read Matthew, the 16th chapter, 1 through 4. The Pharisees and Sadducees came up and they tested Jesus, said, show us a sign from heaven. And he, then he says, you do not, listen, do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky? Yeah, yeah, you say, well, it's going to rain tomorrow. Oh, it's going to be a good day tomorrow. My grandfather could do that as a farmer. I thought he was the smartest man in the world. I didn't know he had a farmer's almanac. <laughs> he was 10 times smarter than I was. <coughs> he says, you can, you, can, you, can, you can tell how a day is going to go by the appearance of the sky and can't discern the signs of the time. Just think about that. You have the ability to discern the times that you live in. Very few people have that privilege. 
Do you know that? That's how bright, that's how bright you can be with God. He said, an evil adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and a sign will not be given except the sign of Jonah. Three days and three nights, not in the air. Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Well, in closing, this is usually when I get amens. People would like to stand up and clap, but they, they spare me. Moses warned the Israelites. Moses warned the Israelites of this ancient religion that was already rooted in the land of Canaan. He does it in Deuteronomy, well worth your time. Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, 9 through 22, he did this in the 5th century B.C. In this warning about this pagan religion, the religion of the Magi come home with, this religion in the 18th chapter, verse 15, he gave a prophetic message of Christ. Listen to what it says. The, here's, here's his prophetic message of Christ in the midst of this. He says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me. From among you, from your countrymen, and you shall listen to him. I wrote this down in John 1, 15 through 19, or, uh, John 1, 19 through 25, 6, chapter 14, 7, chapter verse 40. When John the Baptist came on the scene, and then when Jesus came on the scene in ministry, the people of Israel said, they said to John, are you that prophet? He said, no. They said to Jesus, are you that prophet? And he said, you will see. Because you're going to have to see what goes with that prophet. Because whatever he says, you're going to have to what? You're going to have to hear and believe. See, th there was a tag on this thing. This thing said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your countrymen. And you, you must listen to him. The proof, are, are, when they said, John said, I'm definitely not. There's one coming after me. He will be. So when Jesus came and John says, well, he's the guy. They all went, huh, are you the guy? He said, I don't know. We'll see. The proof will be in the pudding. You ever heard the proof will be in the pudding? Here's some banana pudding. You taste it and you go, <laughs> that's chocolate. You can't, you can't fool a chocolate guy. No, no, that's not banana pudding. I know banana, banana pudding. Eh? See, see, what you're missing is where that prophecy came from. What you're missing is where that prophecy came from. The message from God associated with the king star and the magi was that Jesus is the Christ, the savior of the world, the king of kings, the Lord of Lord. And you ought to take that serious. You should take that serious. Okay, well, that'll do it for today. A little bit wiser. You're a little bit wiser. That's, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, they knew. Yeah, those three gifts that told what they believed about them. Well, let's have let's close this down. Then we're going to have a personal prayer time. Let's pray. Let's close this one down because of the Internet. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight for these that have come our way by automobile and Internet. We pray the Holy Spirit would take the truth. We pray, pray those who have dropped in and listened with us. They can go online and they in a day or so and they'll be able to pick up maybe even now. I'm not quite sure, but they can pick up the notes. Uh, if we went a little bit further, fast for them, they can pick up the notes. Uh, they can stay with our Christmas series on Tuesday night. Um, and uh, I thank you, Father, for these that have had good ears to hear. And we've certainly had them here. And I pray that that would be true on the Internet from around the world. People have dropped in and listened to us. And we're thankful for that. We pray, Father, they would come to understand the, many of the principles we talked about today, that they are a little smarter 
for having been here tonight than they were before they. So we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen.